Hello and welcome to the Forum in the European Parliament in this joint broadcast with Irish TV and Europarl TV. I'm Alan Cantwell. I'm Paul Anderson and we'll be spending the next 30 minutes discussing Europe's perennial thorn, the economy, in particular seen from the perspective of Europe's resurgent poster boy, Ireland. Joining us are four guests, Deirdre Clune from Ireland's governing Fine Gael Party and the European People's Party here. Marianne Harkin, an independent in Ireland and allied to the Liberals here in Parliament. Luca Vicentini, Confederal Secretary of the Trade Union Confederation in Europe. And via Skype from Killarney County Kerry in southwest Ireland, Tom Griffin, Managing Director of Griffin Management Solutions. You're all very welcome to us. I want to start with you, uh, Tom, and perhaps start the discussion on the European Globalisation Adjustment Fund, the EGF. And from your experience and what you have gone through from Anderson Ireland jewellery, that its collapse, and then your, I suppose, your resurgence and your renaissance in your new company, what role did that fund play or did you feel that it contributed significantly to where you are today? I think the, the globalisation fund, it, it's a significant factor for many, many people. Uh, I have to be very upfront and honest and say that I hadn't had a direct uh, involvement in the, the establishment of the, the programme here locally, uh, but there was a very active committee involved in, in uh, processing that. But I think what's, what's really fundamental and what, uh, what the globalisation fund comes in, in in a big, big way is uh, for people to try to understand that it's very difficult to understand without having gone through it is that for people who have worked in a company like Anderson with maybe 30 years of experience came straight from school with a very limited skill base and they suddenly find that the rug is pulled from underneath and their job is gone, their life is really turned upside down. You're forced into a position of having to radically reevaluate what are your skills uh, and what are the opportunities out there? And for many, many people in that situation, the problem is that whatever skills you have don't necessarily match the opportunities that are available. Before we turn to our guests for, for their thoughts on the same issue, um, will the amount of funding available, some two and a half million euros altogether for former employees of Anderson um, Ireland Limited and also for people who most need it to get onto the job market, will that funding, do you think, make any significant uh, difference at all? Uh, absolutely, it will make a difference. The general feeling of those who have engaged with the process is that it has given them a whole new opportunity in terms of the skill set it has given them. So I would have to say that certainly, yes, it is very, very valuable. It won't necessarily solve every solution for every individual, but it is certainly a very valuable uh, resource to have available to the people. Okay, Tom, do stay with us because we'll continue this conversation. Let us just discuss the, um, the fund, the Globalisation Fund, Marion Harkin, and look at the success of this because you've been a champion for this. It's worked very well in Ireland where we have seen Talk Talk Dell, the construction workers have, have benefited from it. But is there an argument to expand its remit and look, for example, at individuals from 15 to 25 who are not trained, who are not in, in education, that we should siphon some of the money towards that or get a budget to, to try and train them or educate them? Well, actually, part of the new regulation is where if, for example, the Anderson case, where they had 138 people who were redundant and who were able to access the fund, if in a situation that the youth unemployment level is at a certain height, and it is in, in the south and, and west of Ireland, then the same number of young people, what we call NEETS, people not in education or training or work, they can access that fund. So not only mm. did 138 workers from Anderson access the fund, 138 young people under the age of 25 not in education or training were able to access it. So that is a change uh, in the new fund and I think it's, it's a very important one because we're trying to make youth unemployment, you know, one of the top priorities, if not the top priority of this parliamentary term and that is one way it's a small way and it's only a start but it's a small way of at least giving those 138 people a little leg up uh, you know up the ladder uh, as far as training or education let is me, concerned. Let me yeah. that to you uh, Deirdre Clune I mean it, it's oh, if you add it up across Europe every year it's 150 million euros which is um, a small contribution significant perhaps in localized areas but a drop in the in in, in the ocean if yeah, you look at very, unemployment. It, yeah the point is though it's very significant in the areas such as this I mean the the, the and former Anderson workers now this is an area that had a very high unemployment rate it was about 38 percent I think so it was double, double the national, the national 
on average, yeah. And it was classified as a disadvantaged area. So it's a very valuable fund for that particular community and communities like it across Europe. But you'd also, you spoke, Alan, about young people and the youth guarantee is addressing that, that particular fund of six billion, it's now 10 billion euro across Europe, uh, uh, focusing on young people under the age of 25 that if, they, if after four months they haven't found suitable employment or uh, training or an education facility then that would be provided for them and that's that's uh, that's a priority of this parliament in fact we've had a number of debates on it so far i'm a substitute on the committee that marion is on as, as well okay. but well, it's a very important uh, initiative and i think in, in ireland at the moment you know, for this year of the 28 24,000 places 16 have been taken up so far this okay well, well Deirdre, let me ask you about how you measure the success of a program like this because it's ultimately long-term sustainable employment That's it, exactly. and the cynics would say that this is merely used to massage the employment figures of the government in any given state well, in that you're taking somebody off the dole queue and putting them into training but we're not sure where it'll training. end up for I, mean, I absolutely training. agree with you but where does it end up statistically in terms of numbers well, that, is, who that is the measurement I mean we've had there are a number of schemes now particularly aimed at young people and the, the jobs bridge program which has got quite a lot of criticism if you like but in fact that's very important an independent report showed that 70, 70 to 90 percent of individuals actually do get employment after that they're offered employment so it, young people offer, it's a va valuable internship project and they do get employment now obviously you have to, to measure all these uh, all, you have to measure the outcomes let's take that point directly yeah. to um, uh, to you to uh, look at Vicentini I mean you've heard a lot over the past five minutes or so about the value of this fund and the potential it has to act as a springboard both for the most disadvantaged and those people who can't get into work or training or education and also for former workers at, at, at this particular company what's your take on it is it the springboard um, that uh, it appears to be uh, from the point of view of our other guests or do you see it in a different fashion well uh, first of all uh, the new EGF is better than the previous one thanks to the Parliament this is the first point that should be addressed because uh, there is a bigger amount first of all there is a, a higher uh, co-financing rate that is really important it's possible to cover different categories of people not only the ones that were covered by the previous uh, the previous tool uh, and it's possible also to try to address uh, restructuring processes in general so this is really relevant uh, to try to address the crisis the efforts of the crisis on, on labor etc etc and also this issue of tackling uh, low skills in the workforce to try to re retrain the people and to re-enter the people into the labor market is a really, really relevant uh, uh, issue, a really relevant feature of the new EGF. But having said that, the point is that all statistics show that these tools are really effective in situations where there are some alternative job opportunities uh, for the people. Uh, if you are in regions like this one in Ireland where the unemployment rate is almost 40% uh, it's very difficult to find new jobs for these people so okay they are uh, they can be retrained they can be uh, part of uh, new programs they be in, uh, be put into the youth guarantee programs etc etc but the problem is that if we don't if we are not able to create new jobs and to provide new job opportunities to these well, people where does the joint up thinking come then in relation to the different facets within Europe that's required in order to put in place in these socio-economically deprived areas the opportunities for the trained individuals well I think that training individuals is very relevant in any case but the problem is that after a crisis like this one a restructuring process like this one the, the one we are considering uh, these people have no opportunity at all in this kind of area so uh, the one pos one possibility is to move these people or to oblige these people to move somewhere else eh? this is something that you can't happens. do that you're taking them out that's, of their, it's their something homes. that happens unfortunately not only in another region of the same countries but there are under and under thousand people moving for example from, from how do you regenerate an area that is so socio-economically deprived by just you, uh, taking it, taking need, it out you rather you than... You need new and different macroeconomic policies, obviously, in the European context, in the okay, national context, I'm going, I'm and in the region. But this is another hold chapter thought, <laughs> of our discussion. I'm yeah. just going to pause there. If you can yeah. hold the thought, we'll be returning to it. Uh, but I just wanted to pause there for a moment to take a look at the similar experiences of sudden unemployment in other parts of Europe before we return to the big question that we've started addressing, which is where the jobs of the future are actually Going to come from. Antonio, à 42 ans, et est une victime de la mondialisation. Tous les jours, il passe devant son ancienne entreprise, une fabrique de chaussures, qui a décidé de délocaliser son activité du Portugal vers les pays de l'Est. 
plus de 900 ouvriers travaillaient sur le site. Tribunal judicial de Santa Maria da Feira. La fermeture de l'entreprise a été un coup de massue pour les travailleurs. Ils ne s'attendaient pas à l'arrêt brutal de leur activité. A gente na altura sabia que tinha aí muitas encomendas, que havia muito trabalho e, e todos os empregados da roda de cabo sempre a 100% para, para a firma não fechar. Claro que as pessoas ficaram revoltadas, muitas, mas o que é que a gente vai fazer? Eles é que mandam e nós temos que cumprir. Isto fechou esta, amanhã abre outra e fecha outro outro dia e abre outra e isto é mesmo assim. Há que andar para a frente. Pour porter assistance aux travailleurs licenciés, l'État portugais a fait appel à l'Union européenne à travers le Fonds européen d'ajustement à la mondialisation. 1,4 million d'euros furent débloqués pour aider Antonio et ses collègues à retrouver du travail. Ils ont reçu plusieurs formations, notamment pour devenir auto-entrepreneurs. Il y a beaucoup d'amis qui n'ont pas été facile. Il y a beaucoup d'amis, amis, collègues de, de travail tiveram que emigrar porque não foi fácil arranjar trabalho para aqui. Houve muitos que tiveram muitas, muitas dificuldades. Tanto que hoje ainda, ainda sei que, que tem colegas que, que trabalham aqui na Rode que, que ainda estão desempregadas. O marché do trabalho português a été duramente touché pela crise económica. Hoje, mais de 800 mil pessoas cherchent du travail, près de uma pessoa sur seis. Pour s'en sortir, certains n'ont pas d'autre choix que de partir. C'est le cas de Miguel, il est ingénieur de formation. Pour trouver un travail, il a décidé de se rendre dans une foire pour l'emploi dans la ville de Porto. Ici, c'est la fuite des cerveaux. Tous les employeurs présents sont européens et recrutent des profils hautement qualifiés. Now I'm on the country seekers uh, stands. I was in Belgium before, Belgium Flanders, and now I'm going to Sweden. Through internet, I haven't been able to find the right door to show and prove my credentials. So I was hoping that these face-to-face interviews, uh, meetings, will help. Antonio, lui, n'a pas dû quitter le pays pour retrouver un emploi. Après la fermeture de son usine et plusieurs mois de formation financée en partie par l'Union, il a créé sa propre activité. Une entreprise de jardinage, il est son propre patron et pour rien au monde, il ne retournerait à l'usine. Ok, un bon exemple de la sorte d'initiatives que les gens prennent pour essayer de trouver leur travail de nouveau. Avant que nous lançons la prochaine partie de ce débat, nous allons revenir à vous, Tom, à Killarney, et vous poser une couple de questions. Dans les dernières couple de semaines, nous avons vu des rapports de presse sur le fait que l'Emerald Tiger est en train de rouler de nouveau, potentiellement 3% de croissance en Irlande au cours des prochaines 5 ans, quelque chose qui ferait que um, d'autres pays EU and Eurozone members in, in Europe, well, let's say, green with envy. Uh, so I have two questions for you. One, uh, how, what was your journey? How did you reinvent yourself after the trauma of Anderson Island Limited going down? And two, what suggestion or plea would you make to European politicians, your representatives here, in order to facilitate the same process for other people? OK, well, I suppose um, for, for myself, um It was very similar to many of my colleagues in that uh, I was at an age profile where I was into my 50s. Uh, your opportunities for going back into uh, employment are very, very limited. Let's be very blunt and honest about that. Uh, when you reach a certain age, uh, you're, you're less attracted to potential employers. Uh, so I can take a very long, hard look at uh, what were my own potential skill sets. Uh, skill sets. Uh, I also had to look at what uh, opportunities may exist in the uh, marketplace. And it was a matter of uh, really trying to look at where I could take my skill sets and apply them to potential opportunities. And for me, the solution uh, was to, to look at the service sector. And, and, and what your recommendations or your, your, your pleas to uh, representatives here, to European policymakers? Uh, I, I suppose my pleas would be very much more in, in a general sense rather than anything specific, and that is. I think what, what a lot of people uh, feel with regard to the, the European legislature, uh, be that through the Commission or through the Parliament, is that very often it gets hung up on ideologies and on uh, the interests of big groups and maybe the, the needs and interests of, of what is really pragmatic and what is really needed are often missed. So really the policies we need to see coming forth from the uh, European scene are those which will really uh, promote uh, true entrepreneurialism. I don't mean by that rampant capitalism. I mean 
uh, an, a spirit whereby people are encouraged through the educational process and into the technology sectors and into the workplace, uh, all of those things to be encouraged to, to come uh, in an integrated fashion forward. Luca, let me bring you in here and try and put an end to this lie about Ireland being the poster boy. It's nothing more than spin and PR on the part of a of the union that's facing despair, that's in an economic quagmire, that has no vision in terms of how to get us out of it. It had its opportunity to do so and it hasn't done it. Let's face it, Ireland's economy is based on our exports and export growth and nothing more. And if we see a situation where the US gets a cold next year and the UK flounders somewhere along the line, we're back to square one. That ain't no poster boy story from Ireland's perspective. Yeah, that there are enormous internal macroeconomic imbalances in the European Union, and this is a problem. We cannot have only export countries or only import countries. We cannot have, have uh, investment going only in the same direction. We need a balanced approach in terms of macroeconomics, I think, and it regards not only Ireland, but in general the European Union. So uh, in the last years, especially after the crisis, we have continued uh, competing each other internally in the European Union, instead of making the European Union as a whole uh, uh, and unite economic system competing towards the external. And this is the first problem. The second problem is that, unfortunately, the only receipt we have, uh, we ha we have had in, the, in Europe to try to tackle the crisis it was austerity and cuts in the public in the public budgets. Uh, this was important, obviously, because we have to rebalance the public budgets. But don't forget that the public budgets are imbalanced also because the, the, mem the st member states save the banks, and so this is not something we can hide under the table. But anyway, now it's time to change the course because without investment, uh, without proper investment plan at the European level, it's impossible to boost job creation. Let me put that question to you, Deirdre Clune. Where do you stand on that? If this increase of demand side that will create investment and create uh, new pathways to resolving the unemployment question demands that there is a, 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 a loosening of the fiscal consolidation, a loosening of austerity measures, can you accept that? Well, I wouldn't say that we've had a, a, a jobless, jobless growth. We've had job, job jobs have been created in Ireland. I mean, Tom, Tom referred to the fact that we need some, some concrete examples of where we're going to get investment from. And you know, we, we, Last week we had the Strategic Banking Corporation announced 800 million euro there provided for to invest in small, medium enterprises in Ireland through our, through our banks, through AIB and Bank of Ireland. I mean, that's a real concrete example of how small businesses on the ground in Ireland can be supported to create jobs for people like the former Anderson's employees. Marion, what's your take on these very delicate balances at the end of which uh, we should see, but aren't really seeing at the moment, a reduction in unemployment levels in Europe? Well, for a start, Alan is absolutely right. If anything happens to the US economy or the UK economy, we're in trouble. Uh, I mean, I was annoyed with Mario Draghi the other day, and it's one of the first times I've been annoyed with Draghi, but I was annoyed with him at his, what I thought was a rather trite response when he was asked about the Trichet letters, and basically he said, look, isn't Ireland doing well anyway? Look at your growth levels. Uh, but he totally disregards the reasons for that. And I think, while we've talked about Junkers 300 billion, and we will all be delighted to see it. And when we talk about the European Investment Bank, and we know that is needed, we also know that we live in a closed circuit of a currency. And while Germany has a surplus, somebody else must be in deficit. And if we have austerity right across the EU, where is the demand going to come from? It is just not possible that it's there. Okay, well, look, sorry. And, and the only yeah. way we're becoming competitive is by pushing wages down, uh, by cutting services, uh, instead of looking for growth and because every country is doing that then there seems to be no way out. Okay well just let me bring you in there Luca and you, and you refer to change and change that is needed in order to stimulate jobs, stimulate growth or whatever. If we take a case in point France, mathematically if you were to look at France in terms of the fiscal compact it cannot get out, it, it, it can't sustain growth under the terms of the fiscal compact. So does that mean that we have to bend the rules a little bit for France? I think we should loosen the rules for everybody, <laughs> because... And now I say that, sorry for cutting across it, but I say that in the context of what happened to us. Yeah. A gun was put to the head of the Irish government that they must adhere to the a set of criteria laid down by Europe. But yet, here's Angela Merkel rowing back saying, well, maybe we can readjust the fiscal compact to help France out. What happens to us? Different rules? 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, th I think we don't have to, 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 to introduce derogation also case by case. We need a, a broader approach, a general approach concerning the fiscal compact. In my personal opinion, in the opinion of the union, so obviously this fiscal compact is not working. But anyway, even if we, if we take it and we, if we keep it as it is, we, we need to uh, introduce some general derogation. For example, investment on innovation, skills, uh, research and so on should be taken out from the, from the fiscal compact targets, uh, as also co-financing for structural funds should be taken out from the deficit and the, the tar targets. In this way, you can try to support uh, uh, internal demand and also investment and, and at the same time to stick to the fiscal compound rules and try to find the right, the right balance. Because it's true that we have some job creation in some countries, but look at Germany. Okay, in Germany, uh, through the different labor market reforms, 7.5 million uh, new jobs have been created in the last 12 years. Okay, it's true. But at the same time, if you look at the figure concerning the number, general number of working hours in that country, the number of working hours now is exactly the, the same than 12 years ago. It means that not a single working additional hour has been created. And at the same time, the 7 million people with these new jobs earn something like 400 euros per month, okay, 40 when, hours. When, no? and when they is are, the Commission they are assisted going to put by the their hands assistance. up and say austerity? Sorry? When is the Commission going to put their hands up and say austerity hasn't worked? We need to look at something else. Yeah. Because that debate's been going on forever yeah, sure. and nobody has said sure. it's not working, here's plan B. Yeah, we should try to, put, to boost an, a new debate, I think, uh, at the European level and try to convince the Commission, but the Parliament can play an important role in this respect to try to change the course. Are you ready to accept that or would you uh, put forward the argument that uh, actually, on the contrary, austerity and fiscal consolidation has worked? Where, where do you stand? If you're looking from the, from the Irish case, the headlines would say we have growth and we have job growth and the economy is projected to grow well over the next three years. I think it's 4.6 this year, and as you mentioned yourself. But people, it comes on the back of a lot of all. suffering. People are feeling it and they have suffered a lot. And I think you know, it was a debate, we spoke earlier about a debate about water charges. It's just, I think it's, for many people, it's a straw that's breaking the camel's back for them. you what then is the solution to that? You have to represent the people well, who I'm are Well, I'm interested in Alan's point there about, but I think like, research is very important. Research innovation is going to be very important. It was mentioned, I, mean, I, I was speaking, looking at um, ICT skills and, and demands in Ireland. There, there are 4,500 to 5,000 vacancies. People can get individuals with the necessary training and experience to employ, not necessarily experience, but necessarily training anyway. And that doesn't mean high level graduates with P PhDs, it means people you know, who have a, a competence in there. Deirdre, I'm just conscious that we're fast running out of time on this, but I want to bring you in there, Marion. And it's wonderful to look at situations with the benefit of hindsight. Mm. But if we cast our minds back to what happened in the run up to our bailout, do you now agree on the basis of what we know that we were bounced into that? And should we have stood our ground and said, no, we're not inviting you into this country. We are not going to accept the terms of your bailout. Well, as you say, hindsight is twenty twenty, and none of us were in uh, Brian Lenehan's shoes and in, in, in their shoes at that time. But nonetheless, we have but, had information that has yes, crept yeah. out to us since that Look, puts us in a position Having to make. seen those letters and having seen the responses, I genuinely believe, and I'm not saying this for political ends, I genuinely believe that Jean-Claude Trichet would not have sent that letter to the German finance minister or the Italian finance minister or the Dutch finance minister. bully boy minister tactics. Because he wouldn't have got away with it. And Ireland, I mean, look, go back to what happened. We were just caught in such a bind. I mean, when Merkel and Sarkozy at Deauvel had this declaration about that the bondholders would take a hit, that that was as good as, as that sank Irish banks because immediately people ran away from Irish banks. So in a way, that actually accelerated the demise of the Irish banking system. We were fully funded until the middle of the next yep. year. So European talk, if you like, hugely damaged our banking system. And then we were put into the position that we were given no choice. Yes, the ECB was pouring money into our banks, but it was going in the front door and going out the back door. But one of the reasons it was going was because of what was being said by Merkel and Sarkozy. So we were bounced into it. There's no doubt about it. And not only did he bounce us into that, you look at the tone of the letter and some of the detail Costing. that's in the letter. Yeah. It was, it, but it also, some of the detail that was in the letter, it wasn't just about a bank bailout, it was about then what we need to do after that. As I said, bottom line, he wouldn't have sent it to many other prime ministers.
OK, we must leave it there to my guests here in studio in the Parliament and indeed to Tom in the lovely Killarney County, Kerry. Thank you for joining us. Uh, that's it from us, from all of you who are watching from across Europe and indeed in Ireland. It's goodbye from myself and from Paul. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.